Welcome to this video. My name is Julian Plank and I'm a researcher in evolutionary computation for now more than 10 years. I'm in that lucky position to work with pioneers and leading researchers in this field. So I have decided to make an introduction video to teach you how genetic algorithms work. I have created an example problem to really give you the intuition behind each of the steps. I hope you enjoy the video. Let us start with an example problem I have designed to teach you how genetic algorithms work. In this problem, we have two shapes, an ellipse and a rectangle. And each of these two shapes does have a width and a height. So now they are combined as follows. We have a thousand times a thousand pixel canvas, which is initially completely white. And we have a black shape here an ellipse. And we have a white shape here, a rectangle. Then we take the black shape and draw it centered on our canvas. And secondly, we take the white shape and draw it on top, also centered. The result is a canvas with black and white pixels. So when we look at our inputs for this problem, it is the first shape with the corresponding width or height. This is always in black. And then the second shape also with the width and height. It is worth mentioning that it's a mixed variable problem, which means we have two shape parameters, S1 and S2, which is zero one variables, either rectangle or ellipse. And we have four continuous variables of load parameters, which define the width or the height of the shapes. Now the optimization goal is to create a canvas with exactly or as close as possible 50% black and 50% white pixels. A bit more mathematically, you can define this as an error function, which wants to be as close as possible to 50% with the relation black divided by the total number of pixels. So now let us look what genetic algorithms are and what their workflow is. They are starting with the initialization. So we have the current iteration counter. In the evolutionary computational literature, an iteration here t equals to one is also referred to as a generation. And we have the initialization step, which outputs a set of solutions here called p of t, which is also referred to as population. So population is nothing else than a solution set. So after the initialization has taken place, putting out p of t, the initial population, we have the second step, which is the evaluation. So we take the population and put it to the evaluator, we are running f of x, our error function. Then the second part of the algorithm execution is the mating process. The mating process takes the current population p of t and creates a so-called offspring population q of t. And the mating has three steps. So it gets the selection, which means you select some individuals. Individual is one solution of a population from p of t. Then we do a so-called crossover, a mutation, and then this creates an offspring. And the output of mating is a new offspring population Q of T. Q of T then is also evaluated using the F of X function. So at this point, we have two populations. We have P of T and Q of T. Now the survival, the third step of the algorithm combines P of T, Q of T together and decides which of these individuals are worth keeping and which of them can be regard discarded. So the output of the survival is a new population P of T plus one, which is a subset of the merged populations. 
Then we either continue with the algorithm, we having a new population p of t plus one we're gonna keep, or we are saying our algorithm has terminated. Usually that happens, we have a generation limit, let's say we are repeating this 200 times, and when our limit is reached, we say the algorithm is terminated. There's three parameters which are worth explaining. So we have the population size, which means what's the number of solutions we keep in p of t. Then we have lambda, which is the size of q of t, which means how many individuals are produced by the mating. And then we have t, which is how many iterations are we running the algorithm. So now next, I'm going to explain all of these steps in a lot more detail using the example from before to show you the intuition behind these steps. So starting with the initialization, the first step of the algorithm, where we are creating the initial population p of one. In these examples, I'm going to set mu, which is the population size equals four. So the goal of the initialization is to create the initial population consisting of four individuals. So how can we do that? One way of initializing is just randomly creating new individuals. So in this case, we just randomly say, take a rectangle or an ellipse, put some uniformly random width or heights together, do the same for the inner white shape, and this is our first individual of our p1. Now we just repeat this process and we create four random individuals to start with. They might not be necessarily really good, but it's just a starting point for our algorithm. Then these individuals are evaluated calling the f of x function. In our case, we just simply count the black and the white pixels and see how close they are to 0.5, which creates here our error function. The optimum in this case for our problem is 0.0, .0 which means we exactly have 50% white and 50% black pixels. Now, the second step, the mating consisting of three sub steps, the selection, the crossover and the mutation. So let's start with the selection. At this point, we have the output of our initial initialization step, which is p of one, our initial population. We start with the selection, which is nothing else than selecting individuals of this current population. So let's just say we are selecting two individuals here, p2 and p3, which is then brought over to the next step to the crossover. In the crossover, we take the two selected parents and we create a new individual. And a new individual is created by recombining properties of the parents. So let us say we are taking the outer black ellipse here from the second parent and draw it on our canvas. And then we take the inner white ellipse from the first parent and also copy it over. So this is now a new individual. It's a new solution combined from both parents. So we are taking properties from both parents, somehow recombine them and we have a new solution. I, I did put here um, an apostrophe because we are not done yet. We, we have to do the, the next step, the mutation to really have our offspring solution. Why the mutation is important because you might realize this crossover operation just takes properties from parents, but might not necessarily introduce something new what the parents don't already have yet. And that's exactly the purpose of the mutation. The mutation takes a property of this current solution and simply changes it. So let's say we take the inner white ellipse and we make this a taller ellipse to have more white space in here. So we take a property, we change it, and then we have finally our first offspring solution, Q1, which is part of the mating process. So now let us look at the overall mating step. 
So we have a current population here, P1, and we create a new offspring population, Q1. For this example, I've set lambda, or the size of the offspring population, to 4. Which means the steps I've shown you on the last slides, the selection, the crossover, and the mutation, they are repeated to create new offspring and fill up the Q of 1 population. So at some point, our population will have exactly lambda individuals, and then they need to be evaluated on our error function. So at this point, we have now two populations. We have P1 and Q1, both all our solutions, and we know the error and fitness values. The survival then takes these two populations, P1 and Q1, and merges them together and has to decide which of these solutions are worth keeping and which of them can be discarded. So this is the first merge operation. So we put them all together in a sometimes called merge population. And now we have to do a subset selection. Out of the set, we want to select exactly mu individuals. Mu was the population size. One way of doing that is we are looking at the corresponding error values and sort them in an ascending manner. So here, for example, we first take Q1 with 0.1 error, then Q3 with 0.5 error, and so on. So now our goal is to select four individuals. And one way of doing that is saying, let us take the four fittest individuals. So in this case, just the upper row, and they're going to be then our new population for the next iteration, P2, which also means the four solutions on the bottom will be lost and we'll never have a look at them again. Now the survival has put it out our P2, which is just the beginning of the next iteration. So having P2, we can now create our Q2, which is our next offspring population, create again, four individuals and just keep going just loop over these two steps the mating and survival mating and survival until our algorithm has terminated so now you might be wondering does this actually work so i have coded up this problem and also a basic version of a genetic algorithm and this is the results and isn't that amazing the genetic algorithm has been creative for us. This is eight different solutions, eight uniquely different solutions provided as an output. And I'm still amazed by seeing how powerful this type of algorithms actually could be because I haven't, honestly, I have not thought about any of these shapes before. Maybe the simple one where you have two rectangles, but the algorithm has learned to actually find new solutions in an amazing manner. Also, I want to note, this might sound or look like a toy problem to you, but in fact, it's not that simple. We do have different types of variables, as mentioned in the beginning. We have discrete variables and we have continuous variables. And many optimization methods, in fact, will be not applicable to this type of problem because they just can handle one variable type. So. What have you done in this video? I really hope I could convince you how powerful genetic algorithms are and to teach you the intuition behind them. But we haven't looked at why are they so powerful? What is the underlying mechanics to make this a concept being applicable to so many different types of optimization problem? Second, I have done some simplifications here and there because I don't want to give you like the small details at first. I want you to understand what is the idea behind the algorithmic concept. But there are some things that we need to talk about. How are variables encoded? Because the encoding is where the um, evolutionary operators, the crossover and the mutation actually work on. And thirdly, each of these operators does have a specific purpose. 
and they can be redesigned, they can be customized to fit exactly your optimization problem needs. So it's really worth thinking about each of these four different operators and learning what is their meaning and how does the algorithm change if I redesign them. So this was the first video in this genetic algorithm series. If you have enjoyed it, please give us a like or a comment below. And also don't forget to subscribe to our channel to get notifications for new videos in the future. See you soon.